This time on the show, something happened to Darren. He's AWOL somewhere in Europe or France or Geneva. I don't know, ITU business or something. And I'm here with cat ears and we're talking about the Yubico. All day and more this time on Hack 5. This segment is brought to you by Untangle. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Hack 5. I'm Shannon Morse. I'm Paul Tobias. You're not Darren Kitchen. No, I'm not. Where did he I'm go? Def um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where he went. <laughs> Europe or something? Yeah, um, um, actually he went to, uh, what was it, Geneva, Switzerland to go to the World Telecommunications. I Center? have this. I Googled it. I was like, WTPF, I don't know what that means, WTF. It means World Telecommunication Policy Forum. Ah. Something having to do with the ITU, and they were like, hey, come out. So he came out. Sounds very, very bureaucratic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of does. Yeah. So Darren's away. He'll be tossing to a couple of interviews later on in the show. But first, something we haven't done in a while, a gift from a fan. Oh, what? We got a gift from a fan? I know. What this is crazy. Here? All right, I'll let you open it because that's what we do here. Okay, I'll open this. And this is here. from Juan. He said, I figured it's always a good Juan, idea yep. to learn a new language. So here's LabVIEW. P.S. It also Juan. works with Arduinos. It works with Arduinos? Apparently so. Holy cow. That would make a great segment. I remember seeing a lot of this software back when I was working at NASA. Oh my this gosh, was some really? some pretty uh, interesting stuff. <laughs> So, got some three-inch floppies cool. in there. Yes. We'll have to definitely boot this up and try okay, it on that's awesome. We got, I think it might work on our laser. Dude, we should totally try that. Yes, I don't know lasers. what it would do, but. We do have a laser here. It has all sorts of sensors. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Speaking of sensors, what do you Speaking got on your sensors. head? Oh, I'll talk about these soon. Soon? Yeah, I'm okay. going to make you wait. <laughs> You're going to make Aren't us wait? Aren't they cute? Aren't they cute? They're adorable. I know. They got Very. a battery pack. Mm -hmm. Meow. Yes, Nickel me, me, meow. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, enough of that talk. Let's go ahead and throw over to Darren, who's talking to Stina about Yubico. As you guys know, the internet is something that is near and dear to all of our hearts. And recently, it was uh, posted uh, by Yubico that it may be at risk. And we actually have Stina here from Yubico. Stina, I saw your blog post. Thank you for coming down here. Why is the internet at risk? Because we put everything in this fantastic creation. We put our personal lives, we put our corporations, we put our governments, and what we do is that we, we secure this really sensitive information I mean, about our you know, personal lives, our companies, and, and things that you really would not, in the physical world, you would not have it, you, know, you, do, you really want us to have it secure. In the digital world, you put a latch on the door that can be easily kicked in. Yeah. And then that latch is the password. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, actually, you, you mentioned the password. There was a huge article recently by uh, Wired about the, yeah. the war on passwords. Are our passwords dead? Is that something that we won't have in the future? Is that the direction we're going? Password, static information, including the legacy username password, and credit cards that also use static information, that technology is dead. We know that, because it's so easy to copy. Anything that is static can be copied and misused. Uh, it, and so what we need to do is to move to two-factor. We need to have username, or actually we can replace the username, but we need to have a password and we need to have an authentication method that generates secure time-based, one-time passcode that only works once. And so I wouldn't say password is dead, because mm -hmm. I think you will always need something you have in your head and something you have in your hand or in your phone um, in order to make it secure. So I think about those one-time passcodes, and they've been adopted in like very large industry, like you yeah. know, government and aerospace, you'll see the RSA tokens, mm -hmm. or, or only like really big and innovative vendors like Google uh, launched their, um, their two-factor authentication app for Android. Uh, so why, what barriers do you think it, there are in the actual adoption of those kind of one-time, you know, multi-factor authentication mechanisms to actually kind of secure, like put better than a latch on yeah. our digital lives. So the Google Authenticator is great. I think that initiative really proves, and it's, it's getting millions of users. It's the, the biggest deployment of two-factor, and it's so much better than a standard password. 
the, the, you know, the static password. However, it's sort of not really user friendly. You have one a key to one account, and sometimes you have to retype the code from a device to another device. Um, and it's an app, you have it on your phone. And we know with the new viruses that come now, that anything you put on a phone is at risk in the same way you put it on a computer. So, so, so you don't believe in the whole idea of doing this in software? Unfortunately not, it would be nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could do, 10 years ago it was possible. Now we're seeing a new generation security threats that requires you to move out your sensitive data from your phone or from your laptop or from you know, any device that's connected to the internet to an external key. And so why do you think it needs to be an external key? Why does it need to be a physical device? Um, you know, there, there, why couldn't it be like integrated into uh, the, the SIM card? Yeah, it can be. So I would say it could be in the SIM card. However, then your identity is tied to your phone. Mm -hmm. And you may want to have multiple identities. And you do have multiple identities. You have your work identity, your private identity, your real identity, and your, you know, your blog identity, or your gamer identity. There are, there, and it's difficult if it's one identity that's tied to your phone. So we currently, we actually have that right now in that, you know, I, I do. I've got my gamer tag and it's got one yeah. password and then I've got my bank and I use a much more secure password. But you talk about identity and really what we're talking about is moving that from like the device or just that one factor uh, and, and into multi-factors and not tying it to specifically like this is my my phone, so I am this on this device, and this is my tablet, so I am this on that device. Yeah. So the vision that we outline is that you buy your key, which could be a ring, it could be a card, it could be a UV key, on 7-Eleven or Safeway or Amazon, just like you buy a prepaid phone card. You take this card to your home, and you tie it to your bank account, to your Gmail account, to your Gmail, to your gaming account, anything online. With open identity standards, one key could be used on multiple authentication, on multiple, multiple services, uh, without one service having to hold the encryption keys or control your identity. So you would be t in total control of your identity. You would buy it, own it, and control it. And you could be anonymous and secure. So I think it's really innovative and, and, and a great step forward what Google has done, at least in protecting my Google identity with their Authenticator app. Uh, but I don't want to have, obviously, a different app for every different you know, social network or website that I use. Um, and there's already uh, several different you know, concepts for open, you know, there's open ID, there's open uh, there's OAuth. Uh, there's several of these you know, platforms for this. None of them have really taken off. We, we've seen like the open source ones like you know, OpenID, and then we've seen like the past failed efforts like Passport. How is your vision different from those? I think these initiatives with OpenID and SAML and OpenID Connect are great initiatives, and they all move in the same direction. It has to be open. It has to be scalable. None of them are really taking the security to a next level, uh, enabling session security, you know, legally binding signature is more of a single sign-on convenience factor mm -hmm. than the high security factor. So tell and me about that high security. What are you talking about? What's this next level? Because yes. if the idea is, you know, I type in my password, I plug in my YubiKey or whatever it may be that does the one-time password, and then boom, I'm into the system. Now I'm in. I don't need my password or my, my key anymore. I'm, I'm logged in, right? I've got my session. Yes, yeah, so there are two, two security threats. The, you know, they're back end that needs to be secured. And, and with, so with these existing initiatives, with SAML and OpenID, they, they're depending on one service provider that holds your credentials. And we all know, we see that with RSA, you know, one of the most secure companies supposed to, they, they got hacked and 15 million tokens were compromised. So we really need to look at system where you don't have one single service provider that holds credentials, that holds cryptographic secrets. So that's on the one side. And then on the user side, we're seeing a new generation threats that actually where the one-time password technology, including Google Authenticator, is not going to be secure enough a few years ahead. And it's the threats for session security and cookies you know, being hijacked. You can actually log in, if you log into your bank account with a secure token, if it's not a challenge response interaction between the token and the service, um, 
you know, someone can hijack your identity and start misusing it in real time just after you log in while you're in that session. So that's sort of. Well, we've seen examples <laughs> like that with like Fire Sheep. You know, it's like yeah. I've stolen your session cookie. Now I'm you. I didn't even need your password. You know, this is very much in, in the vein of what we've been talking about on Hack5 recently in that whose responsibility is it to secure your data? Or not just, you know, your, your login, your data, all of those things. Um, is it the service provider? Is it the, the cloud service? Uh, or is it you? Thinking about replacing your outdated firewall, your gateway, or your UTM? Wondering how Untangle stacks up? Well, you might be surprised. Untangle is the most complete solution out of the box. You can skip the multiple appliances, the hidden costs and add-ons, and the really annoying sales reps. Whether you're looking for a hardware, software, or a virtualized solution, Untangle gets the job done for a lot less cash. You can run Untangle in your network for free with no commitment just by installing it on commodity PC hardware. If you just need minimum protection, you can run the light package. It's open source and it's always free of charge. If you need something a little full featured solution with advanced web filtering, application control, policy management, bandwidth control, you'll want the premium package, which includes every single app that Untangle makes. Hack5 viewers get a 14-day free trial of the Untangle premium package apps and will save 20% off the list price with the promo code HAK5. You can just go over and visit untangle.com slash hack5.